Bill Viola has been exploring video art since its beginnings in the 1970s and is increasingly recognized as one of the most important visual artists working today. His work includes single channel pieces as well as large scale sound and image installations. Viola embraces the latest digital technology while continuing to draw inspiration from traditional art, including the fresco paintings of the Italian Renaissance. Although much of Viola's work is grounded in personal experience, the images he makes have universal resonance. Silent Life was basically handheld camera documentary style looking at the faces of newborn babies in the uh, maternity ward in a hospital. The impetus, I think, was light. And I remember having this whole dialogue with myself about the first light a human being sees, about the moment when the eye is open for the first time and the light of the world comes in. And of course, at that time, having read a lot of you know psychology and perceptual studies and a lot of things like that, I was fully aware that that we don't necessarily know how to read light and turn it into an image. That's something that's learned. And I guess I wanted to try to get in there as close as I can to sort of see the advent of seeing. This one baby they wheeled in, and I'd never forget that face, and I focused on that one a lot. Those eyes that couldn't see, but know. You know, you, so you can see, instead of seeing, recognizing the visible world, you're just seeing knowing, you know, the beginning of knowing, that there's a new, a new experience here. Oh, he's always an artist. I recognized relatively early that I, I did this. This is one thing I did well. And it was kind of my world that I could control and that, that I could create in the way that I wanted to.
think back to my really early childhood, I remember staying up while everyone had gone to sleep. I remember even hearing my parents, the bathroom, you hear the toilet flush, the sink, and then it gets quieter and quieter and you hear movement in the bedroom, and then all of a sudden stillness. And I remember just staring up at the ceiling and watching, uh, I mean, I don't know what you would call it, I guess maybe retinal grain or noise. I mean, just this swirling sort of salt and pepper type display. And I remember watching that and thinking that I was looking to some other place that um, I could only see if it was dark. This is Jack Nelson, that's my college professor. I came to him because I had been failing advertising in university. It was a dismal disaster. My parents, you know, being good parents, when I went to art school at Syracuse University, they said you have to study advertising because that's the only way artists make a living. So I spent a year and a half, horrible year and a half, failing miserably because I was like late for class most of the time. And finally my advertising teacher said, why don't you go over and see Jack Nelson? Uh, he said he's just created this new department called Experimental Studios. So I go down this dark hallway and I hear this flurry of activity in this room and this guy comes running out of the room going, I'm projecting vegetation on the moon, I'm projecting vegetation on the moon, you know, and the other students go, yeah, yeah, you know, and so I went into the room and there was toilet paper all over the floor. He took the center cardboard tubes of rolls of toilet paper and, and taped them onto the front of a eight millimeter movie projector so he could narrow down the image to this little round kind of shape. And he had a paper mache uh, three foot across model of the moon hanging from the ceiling and he was projecting a time lapse film. It was actually a speeded up film of grass blowing in the wind really violently in the seashore. And he was projecting that on this paper mache moon. And I said, um, excuse me, I'm looking for Pe Professor Nelson. And he goes, that's me. <laughs> and I thought, I'm home. <laughs> At Syracuse University, Bill Viola also studied electrical engineering, literature, mysticism, and electronic music. Sound has always been an essential element in Viola's work. One of his early mentors, the avant-garde musician and composer David Tudor, was a close associate of John Cage. Viola frequently performed in Tudor's electroacoustic installation, Rainforest 4. If I think back on that time, I'd have to say that uh, there was a, a, a very strong interplay between political social activism and uh, artistic exploration. Those two things were, uh, in my mind anyway, part of the same 
process. I didn't really think of them as being at odds with each other. Uh, it was the Vietnam era um, political protest in my generation was, you know, kind of a part of daily life practically, and that was my kind of coming of age in a political sense. Bill, I understand you've volunteered to be the spokesman and let us know what the group is into. Yeah, well, basically, uh, at present, we've been involved in wiring up the campus for a uh, cable television network, uh, which will also include a one-inch color studio. Uh, this, the studio will be entirely installed and run and operated by the students. There won't be any uh, interference from any outside sources at all, so we'll be able to uh, just about decide what we want to see and what we'd like to show. The thing that empowered the whole video movement at the beginning was the fact that us, me, myself, i.e. the people, could make their own television or could make uh, television in their image rather than in the image of some giant corporation that was sort of, you know, controlling us and telling us what to think and what to buy. Is there any good buy in meat today for the consumer? Nothing uh, is good at any particular time, really. It's just uh, a question of what, uh, what specials are being featured. In addition to the, the technological revolution became a revolution, uh, both socially and politically, as well as artistically. And it was really about changing the world, and that was something that was in part, just a part of my life. I, I practically didn't question it. You know, therefore, if I was an artist and I was going to be making art, you better damn well make something that's going to change someone's life and change the world. I think the turning point for me was when I did a work called Room for St. John of the Cross in 1983. I came across this Christian saint who in 1577 was taken away in the middle of the night by the Inquisition and put in a tiny cell and uh, couldn't stand, couldn't really lie down very comfortably. He was taken out once a day and tortured, basically whipped. And his response to that was to not hate his tormentors, but to write love poetry. When I was younger, that would have been a cop-out. Right? I mean, you have to become hardened as a political activist at that point and go out and really, you know, get, you know, fight back. But here was a, a guy, a Christian, who was living the life, the path of love and forgiveness. And he wrote these poems that have changed the world and have inspired many, many people. And that idea of moving from social perfection into self perfection was really, really important for me. I see the possibility of liberation uh, of the soul as well as the body as being tied into, you know, political realities. This sound that we're listening to now is really very special. It's the sound of wind coming in the open windows while driving. And I've actually recorded that sound uh, a number of times. Um, the piece I made in uh, 83, uh, Room for St. John of the Cross, uh, has that sound in it. It's a beautiful sound because it's, you can't quite place it. Is it, is it close? Is it far away? And of course, it's very deep, and it's, uh, I think it's a primordial kind of sound.
I remember the first time I came out to these kind of places that I looked out as far as the eye could see, literally, which is such a liberation of sight, you know, from the confines that we typically enclose ourselves in. And I got this strong feeling that um, a big hand could just come down and just flick me away like a little black speck in this vast environment, like as if I was just an insignificant little flea, you know. Um, at the same time, I also felt a part of me kind of rush outward with every sight line that I was looking at in the landscape and connect with that land, that distant view, the, the mountains a hundred miles away, being connected to all of it. You have a lot of people that come here to, to sort of be alone and to be quiet. I mean, what other response is there to this but silence, you know? When I was six years old, my family was on summer holiday and we were staying in this, this small lake in the mountains. My cousin and I went out to this raft which they had that you could dive off of. My uncle was there and we had these inner tubes on around our waists and my cousin Tom jumped first and he swam away and then I jumped and I forgot to hold on to the inner tube and I sunk right to the bottom. I saw the most beautiful world I'd ever seen in my life. Shafts of light coming through, blue-green light, plants under there kind of moving in the currents. There were small fish, and it was like paradise. It was absolutely beautiful. And I just watched it with absolutely no fear, and I think one of the most peaceful moments of my whole life. And then this huge hand came down and grabbed me by the stomach and pulled me up. And I broke the surface and I didn't even know where I was. I, I didn't think I was drowning. 
I knew I didn't want to come up. This is uh, the Upper Basilica in um, Church of St. Francis in uh, Assisi. And uh, there's a number of artists that worked in this space, but the one that I'm most connected to uh, is Giotto, who did an extraordinary series on the life of St. Francis, just above head height, right across the central nave, down the back and up the other side, in a series of three panels each in each bay in the church. At the time, this would have been like 3D reality pictures. It really is amazing. The thing you have to understand with all of these so-called old masters is they weren't old masters. They were young Turks. They were young radicals with new ideas, and they were just exploding out what was possible artistically in technical terms and aesthetically. What uh, impresses and inspires me about this is the kind of totality of the work. I mean, when we come in here and, and when I look at these things, you get absorbed in each of these panels. But in reality, the piece is the entire space in which you are surrounded by images. The piece that I made in, in uh, 1986, I do not know what it is I am like, is about this problem that we have in contemporary life to inability in a way to not only empathize but to actually uh, uh, reflect and become the other, another being. And there's a long sequence in there just looking into animals' eyes, right into their eyes. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done, to videotape my mother on her deathbed. My mother had been struck uh, in her sleep by a brain aneurysm, and three hours later passed into a coma and never regained consciousness.
So I guess I I really felt in some ways I needed to reach for the one thing in my life that's given me security and made me feel that I do have some kind of control over my life from when I was young, um, which is video. And so I asked my father and my brother who were there at the time if I could um, take a few shots of mom. And then about a month and a half later, um, I got a call from German television where I'd been doing this project for the last two years that I had this massive writer's block about shooting in the desert. And they wanted either their money back or they wanted the program finished. It was one of the worst things. I had really canceled projects. I laid aside about four or five months just to grieve. And here I had to go back in the editing room and back to work. Sitting in that studio, I never did this before, but I decided to bring some of my home videos over because I wanted to see my mom again. I remember sitting there looking at it like this, you know, I, I just taking glimpses of it. And then it just hit me at that point that I was making a film about her passing, about life itself, birth and death. And it was all centered on the desert, this huge amount of footage that I had. And so I did the passing very quickly, like three weeks of intense work and it was pretty much there. And then the next year, I did a piece called Heaven and Earth, which is two monitors facing each other, and on the top one is my mother on her deathbed, and on the bottom one is my our second son, who was born almost nine months to the day after she died. And the glass on the two monitor tubes reflect each other, so you see reflected on his little new face with the eyes that are opening for the first time, you see my mother who is leaving the world. And then I did non triptych, which is a pretty much of a of a standard uh, compositional form of the altarpiece with two wing panels and a central panel. The left panel shows a woman in childbirth, a, f a friend, uh, magnificent birth, and then um, an image of my mother on her deathbed, and then the central image is a, just a fully clothed man just floating, like limply in this black void. And I guess I felt these are the great universal experiences. They happen to be the most private personal experiences, and a camera is the embodiment of the invasion of privacy, which is where the tension comes in. But I also look at a camera as an open eye. I mean, part of spiritual practice and spiritual training is to reteach yourself how to see, 
So this guy isn't always making all these judgments on, on what you're seeing, but you're experiencing the world and the image in its pure form, in its open form. This is Pope Innocent's dream right here. He had a dream that this little monk was holding up the church that was falling over. And I think one of the things you see in these works is this kind of fluidity between uh, dream space and our inner world and the outer world. I mean, the, 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 the dividing line between those was very porous and very transparent. And that occurs a lot. Of course, you have St. Francis, who was truly endowed with gifts of vision. And he used to go to the mountains on retreat, and they'd build him a little cell, and he'd stay there for days and days and weeks and weeks, and fasting and meditating on the mountainside. These are people really at the edge of life, with utmost seriousness, going as deep as you can into the act of being alive itself. This here is one of my um, project books, what I call project books. They're, they're books I, I write when uh, I start, when I know that I'm going to be going into a specific set of ideas and coming, coming up with specific ideas for pieces. I go away at one point. Um, I do this from time to time. I just sort of get out of town for maybe two or three or four days lock myself in a room somewhere and just bring a lot of books and just kind of plow through things and try to feel if things are ripe enough that, that some of the things can be distilled out of this cloud that I'm constantly in and turn into like some real substantial pieces. And it's very kind of, it's fun, you know, kind of improvisational. I just start writing and thinking and invariably something takes shape. So here's ideas I felt were connected under the title Unexplained Figures and Simple Actions. Here's a bo bunch of stuff coming out, groups of figures, businessmen in suits and ties huddled together at dusk, their faces concealed by the fading light. Um, man bound and gagged in a chair, disintegrating figure. One day, this thought popped into my mind of a uh, man on fire. I mean, I even wrote it in my notebook like that. It was like a, like a one-liner. And I just wrote it down, put it away. And then some months later, I don't know when, um, it popped up again. You know, image of a man. And it was a little further developed. And then maybe six to nine months later, in another notebook, there was another one. And I realized that this little kernel of a thought was evolving in my life while I was just going on and doing everything else. And then all of a sudden, it was like water pouring on this guy, not just fire. Over the course of several years, this peace formed itself in the unconscious mode.
And then the final thing was, um, I guess what happens for me is it's like this nagging thing, like someone tugging on your shirt sleeve very gently at first, and then at the end they're like trying to grab you and say, make me, you know? And then I knew I really had to make it. So here's a bunch of quotes, one of which here is one of my favorites from St. John of the Cross. Human science is not capable of understanding it, nor experience of describing it. Only one who has passed through it will know what it means, though there will be no words for it. So the wordless knowledge. So the end of this, this four-day retreat thing... Finally, all of that ends up in lists and lists and lists and more lists and then occasional new ones and then it ends up in this, which is, um, I don't know, I, I haven't counted these. I think there's something on the order of like 50 uh, pieces here. I will make some of these, I'm sure. You know, I don't know how many. Uh, it's not important. But this is a whole journey that um, I've kind of sketched out, I guess, without actually making it yet. Recently, Bill Viola has moved on from the documentary mode to more controlled production involving actors, costumes and sets. He is increasingly taking on the role of director as well as artist. It's really hair-raising when you go into production. I mean, this is where my Zen training has to come into play. You have to be so alert and aware, like, a, like an antenna or an open wound or something. You have to be just so aware of all these little details, because any one of them could turn out to be the scorpion's tail that just comes right up and stings you right in the end. What I see going over here, the left two quadrants have just a touch more color than the right two quadrants. The lower right quadrant and the outer side of the lower right and upper right are getting a little washed out. A lot of the stuff I've been doing is um, very controlled. Um, on the other hand, I mean, working with people in such a close way that I have been doing these last few years, I think in a way they are okay, good. the chance elements. Uh, no, then you'd lose it. Okay. There's a, like one, kind of what we did with the resurrection, there's a force pulling you yeah. up this way, right? Yeah. But instead of going like this, yeah. if you could show me a kind of a thing like this. Yeah. Something right here. Yeah. Taking your heart. It's got yeah. your heart going up. I know what you mean. It's just figuring out. Mm. Okay, we'll Kira is... Um, I mean, I almost can't talk about Kira because she's so intertwined with who I am and what I am. Kira is, um, well, she's my wife and lifelong partner. She's also my kind of working partner, business partner. She pretty much is the brains behind the operation in the studio. She's done a lot of the books that we, we've worked on together. And roll camera! Very often I'll keep her out of the process for a long time. And then I'll bring her in as the kind of new eye. But it's certainly not a naive eye because she, she's so connected with the work and we share a lot of the same values about the, the nature of what we're doing. Um, she's really literally saved some of the pieces from disastrous ruin at the hands of, of this this thing up here. 
Okay, beautiful. Okay, woo! Great, 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 great. How was that? Was that okay? Yeah. Are you all right? The Passion series kind of evolved, I think, gradually. What opened me up was the connection to people through what the old masters were doing. It's about the depth that's within people. And when you're seeing those people, you're having a moment with the being presence of another person from another age who's no longer with us. That's precisely how people use photographs today. I have a photograph of Tanaka Sensei here, my Zen teacher, and I look at that from time to time, and I, even though he's no longer with us, I get this strong feeling of his, his presence. That's, I think, what really connected me with that art in a new way. I had this whole connection in another way in my personal life with, with life, having kids, seeing my parents leave this earth, and... Um, all of that stuff, I think, came to a focus in 1997 when I was invited to be a scholar in residence at the Getty Research Institute. And the theme of that year was representing the passions. How do you represent extreme emotional states which by their definition involve losing control, losing sense of self? One of the paintings that I looked at more than any um, was a work by Dierick Bouts. This was painted in the early 1450s. I just fell in love with this painting. It's so austere and zen-like. Of course, this is the one of the most special moments that's ever been uh, represented. And that is the moment when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary to tell her that she's pregnant. But what it really is, is about the time when we know something in the place before words and before language. Because this kind of conversation that's going on here is not the conversation we're having now. This is a conversation on a different dimension. I mean, the way that a woman inside knows that she's pregnant, it's an inner knowledge in a way that isn't about verbalization. And that's the magic of all of the Annunciation scenes. There, this kind of quiet stillness of that moment when this being who is here represented as a person, but obviously in reality this is a voice speaking to you, you know, from some deep, deep place.
Well, this is another one I, I used to look at a lot, the dream of Pope Sergius. What I love about this was this simultaneity of the spaces where you see inside the interior. I mean, this is a bedroom, right? So this is completely, you know, impossible that, that they would have this open wall here. It's there so we can see in uh, to this special moment of, of the dream. And then here he is again out here. He's simultaneously existing with himself in two places at once in the landscape, yet this is not a separate panel or image. So you have this idea which we've completely lost today in the age of cameras and the logic of you know, imagery based on optics and, and how the eye sees the world, is we've lost this idea that someone could be in two places at once. Yeah. It's put together in a kind of cranky way that's perfectly, <laughs> uh, you know, suited to the storytelling purpose. So you get a kind of zigzag through the space, which isn't very likely to have happened in real life. Right. Uh, but happens right. in a space that's shaped to make it happen. What's been interesting for me in my work, being influenced by this kind of sense of space and simultaneity instead of sequentiality, like I'll lock down the camera and I won't move the camera and I'll just keep recording. So instead of, okay, John talks, we get you. And then you move the camera over here and then Bill talks. And then we have this kind of, and then we come back here and we shoot us together with the painting and, and we're both talking. And then in the editing room, they will cut those things together in a language that is so obvious and familiar to people, they don't even see it as a language. It's a, it's a way of structuring space and time. But when you keep the camera still, you're in this kind of space where time is unfolding as a continuous process. And when I started working with the Passion series, I realized that I couldn't move the camera. If I was going to move the camera, the motion I was after would get disrupted because the motion I was after is the motion of the continuity of an emotional wave that comes up and passes through a person and subsides. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, what I'd like to do is just start um, Bill, but just talking about, uh, you know, here we are alive in probably one of the most aggressive, very materialistic, violent periods in the history of the world. So how is it that you make Catherine's room? Huh. Refuge. Um, calm the still point of the turning world, privacy, which is a very big issue today. We're being robbed of any real privacy and solitude, which is at the source of moral judgment. And um, the situation that's going on in the world right now comes from a lack of Catherine's rooms, the lack of the space in Catherine's room. What's going on in Catherine's room is actually the linking of a life to the larger cycles of nature, which are eternal because they're cyclical. And so the window starts with um, both early morning and spring and goes through afternoon and summer and uh, sunset and autumn and night and winter and then the fifth one of course is the void there's not even a tree left in the window in her little window and that's of course when she's making her bed and preparing for death at the end of the day one of the things that 
was most deeply upsetting to me mm. about the work that's on display in this show mm. is you taking on the techniques of commercial photography mm. and that horrifying lighting and you using the techniques of Hollywood mass production images to still try and touch something unspeakable mm. and invisible. And this contradiction is really painful in some of the works. You used to shoot unbelievably privileged video of an actual birth right. or your mother dying. Now you hire an actor, have makeup brought in, costumes, light. The whole thing is an artificially constructed right. scenario. That enables you to get what you couldn't get shooting your mother in the hospital, right. which is you know higher resolution, beautiful skin tone. You know the image is more materially present. But does that impede uh, the spiritual transparency? Ah. How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, well, I began to realize, you know, I can't, there's certain things I can't squeeze out of the world with my little camcorder kind of walking around with the open eye. I needed another form of technology to touch, to evoke. I think it was Giotto, probably, you know, when I started looking at why his landscapes look so phony and, I mean, it looked like theater sets to our eye, you know. And I realized that, um, that what he was going after was not about rocks and trees and how real they look to this. It's about what's going on in here. That's the fidelity he was going for. I discovered some kind of reality in the unreality. So this kind of really high-tech image all of a sudden becomes the portal, the opening for the other world. You look at these incredible works uh, that Giotto painted, each panel is a masterpiece practically, and yet it doesn't stop just at the art. These are messages, timeless messages of humanity striving for perfection and to transcend ourselves. These are source, pure sources of inspiration, both in terms of content and the form. That's what's very powerful. I think all art does that, 20th century art included. Um, does that ultimately. The, the, the actual container sort of just drops away and you're just left staring at the true image, you know, which is not visual. In the course of my reading, I've come across Ryokan, who's one of my special, special people in my life. Uh, he was alive from the late 18th century to the mid-19th century. Uh, and he lived for 35 years in a little hut on a hillside in the uh, western 
uh, part of Japan, very, very um, remote and uh, intense, very strong weather. I sit quietly, listening to the falling leaves. A lonely hut, a life full of renunciation. The past has faded, things are no longer remembered. My sleeve is wet with tears. <laughs>